Have you ever read a story that leaves you different afterwards? A story so disturbing, so upsetting, so difficult that you're you're just not the same when it's done. That story for me is Chino Adachi. A Trail of Blood or Blood on the Tracks, depending on what you're going with for your translation. My translation is A Trail of Blood by Shuzo Oshimi. Now, I did a video on this in January of last year, and I hadn't gotten back to completing the little uh, two-parter on it yet because it hadn't finished. It did, though, wrap up in September of 2023, and I'm just getting to it now. The reason being I wanted to do some more fun stuff in the meantime because this is a heavy, heavy story, and I do want to give you that content warning now for the things on screen. It covers these things, or at least touches upon them, and it is difficult if those things are no goes for you. So again, content warning for those, as well as a massive spoiler warning for the entirety of A Trail of Blood. I won't really be recapping anything in this. I did do that other video. I strongly recommend you going and checking that out, as it is essential viewing to understand what's happening here in the final third that I'll be covering in this video. If those subjects are too much for you, though, definitely go and watch one of the other videos I have. There's more lighthearted, fun ones on there. There's a Scarlet and Violet one uh, for Pokemon that I'm really, really proud of, actually, and you should definitely go and give that a like, as well as liking this video if you love me. But with all that now said, let's dive into the miasma of sadness and trauma and follow Seichi's journey along this trail of blood. Seichi's story is one of generational trauma. His life is dominated and controlled by an overbearing mother who can hardly be said to really care for him at all. The odd feelings and strange bond they share eventually leads to a number of deeply upsetting incidents culminating in the death of Seichi's cousin, Shigeru. Seichi is then sentenced for Shigeru's murder and sent to a juvenile detention facility, and that's where we left things off in the last video, as directly following his sentencing we get a time skip of over 20 years. Now, post time skip, we see someone who's very far from the innocent child that we started with in the beginning of this story. He is 36 years old now, and Seichi is looking worse the wear for it. We also see that he just seems to be automating his entire existence. A good summary of how he's doing comes from his own mouth. He feels that his life and his own self are over, but that he somehow just keeps living. We see him going through the motions of his life like a robot, each step designed solely to carry him from one thing to the next with as little thought as possible. Even his job is one that's assumably selected for how mind-numbing it is. It's a very straightforward factory job in a food processing plant, and it's also a night shift. So in every aspect of his life, he's doing his best to keep his thoughts surface level and his human interaction at the bare minimum, allowing him to just continue droning through life. His first real brush with another human being that we see comes in the form of his estranged father. We find out later in the story that Seichi was eventually released from the juvenile detention facility and after spending a brief period living with his father, decides to move to Tokyo as soon as he finishes high school. After several missed calls, he finally decides to call his father back and they make plans to meet on an upcoming business trip and forgo sitting in Seichi's disgustingly messy apartment for a walk in the sun. Unfortunately, this stroll is soured by the sight of a loving family out for their own walk hand in hand with each other and the silence that passes between Seichi and his father Ichiro says more about their relationship than words ever could. Eventually they wander into an izakaya and share a few beers and some comfort food and once again here we see how incredible Oshimi is at conveying so much with just eyes. As we get a glimpse at Ichiro looking at his son with a look that seems to be love and happiness and sadness and regret all pooled into one. We also get further context for their estrangement. Ichigo remarks to their server that this is the first time he's seen his son in a long time, and that this is the first time they've sat in an izakaya like this together. Now, Seichi is 36 at the point of this chapter, and if this is their first time sitting down for a meal like this, which is something that, as far as I'm aware of, is very common in Japanese culture, then they really haven't been in touch since he moved out. Seichi does his best to keep his walls up throughout their time together, occasionally letting slip how he feels about himself and how undeserving he is of life or love or happiness. And when it's finally time for the two to say goodbye to each other, Ichiro, like an idiot, asks Seichi if he's really okay with never seeing Seiko again for the rest of his life. All Seichi has to say is that yes, isn't it obvious? And I'd love if someone could buy Ichiro a clue because obviously the man can't afford one himself. Of course that's the answer. Thankfully, he doesn't push the matter. Ichiro just apologizes for asking and once again says his goodbyes. This meeting may not have been much, but it's a start. Though, one thing that really sticks with me here is that while Ichiro's trying to reach out to Seichi in the ways that he feels he can, it's not enough. Seichi has been failed over and over again in his life by those who should have been looking out for him. And the important thing is the language used when Ichiro is talking to him. When Ichiro says he's sorry he couldn't do more or couldn't have done more for Seichi, that's not entirely true. He could have, he didn't. 
People like to use those words interchangeably, couldn't and didn't, but they are so far apart from one another. Couldn't allows you to shirk responsibility. It allows you to say that there were other factors, or at least infer that there were other factors that stopped you from being able to do these things. Didn't requires you to take responsibility for your actions, and it's not something Ichiro does. Ultimately, Ichiro didn't notice his wife's steady decline into madness and then the steep drop after the incident with Shigeru. He didn't notice the effect this was having on his adolescent son. He didn't do anything as his household fell apart around him, and most importantly, he didn't do enough to help his own son after he got out of the juvenile detention facility. And I know it sounds like I'm making a lot of assumptions, but trust me, we'll get into why I feel that way later. The effects of their meeting on Seiichi become evident quite quickly. The lid he's tried to keep on his trauma starts to slip loose. And this is a term he uses in the story, that he's tried to put a lid on it, but it keeps coming loose. A sudden flashback to his mother Seiko's face while he's working causes him to just go stock still and end up letting go of a trolley, causing it to crash into another and creating a bit of an accident. Thankfully, no one was hurt. He's just admonished by his asshole boss and sent home early. It's then he discovers missed calls and a message about his father from a hospital in Saitama. We see some emotion in him for the first time since that time skip as he rushes to the hospital and his old problems flare up again. His face contorting into a mask of panic, gritting his teeth together just to try to explain what he needs to explain to the receptionist here. Again, it just being very clear the physical effects that this stress and this trauma has on Seiichi. After managing to get the words out, he finds out that his father had to undergo emergency surgery and he has yet to wake up. It's possible, according to the doctor, that he may never wake up again, so they reached out to Seiichi as his next of kin to let him know. Seiichi does his best to go about his life as normal while he waits for word about his father's condition, and his father does eventually wake up. They share a few words when he does, his father telling him he has some money and documents aside in case anything happens. And Seiichi kind of blows him off on this. He's just like, you know, no, I'll get you those tomorrow and you can have them. Don't, don't talk like that. And then he goes to speak with the doctor. Once he comes back from talking to the doctor, Ichiro is not entirely lucid anymore. He's stuck in a kind of hypnagogic state, barely awake. It's all he can do to reach out and weakly grasp Seiichi's hand and simply say, I'm sorry. A very simple apology, a very straightforward apology, but the most honest one Seiji has gotten so far. And while it's been a long time coming, the words do ultimately have an effect on Seiji, especially considering that as Seiji finds out a few days later, they were the last he'd ever say to him. He travels to the hospital after getting the news of his father's passing from the doctor, and then with the assistance of a funeral director who was present at the hospital, moves the body home to rest. After some prompting from that funeral director, he remembers the documents his father mentioned and roots them out. In Ichiro's last will and testament, he lets Seichi know that he doesn't need a big funeral, it's okay if it's just him, and also that there's money aside for the expenses as well as some money that has been put aside for Seichi, though Ichiro wishes he could have left him more. You see, he's apparently been paying reparations to Shigeru's parents for what happened, about 80 million yen over the last 20 or so years. Now, for context, at the time this was written, that comes to about $690,000. Let me know in the comments if I'm wrong with the conversion rate on that, but that's insane. Over half half a million dollars in about 20 years. This is what I meant earlier when I said he could have done more for Seiichi and didn't. Now I understand that Shigeru's family deserves something for his death, but money will never bring him back and that much money certainly won't heal the wound left behind by his loss. But the financial freedom that just a third of that money would have given Seiichi. I know Ichiro couldn't have forced him to take it or forced him to go to therapy, but the financial freedom that may have given him to work on himself and actually try to make space to process his trauma is just insane. And when I say insane, I mean it's insane that Seiichi never saw a cent of that money. He has left some money by his father, nowhere near that amount. And again, I'll repeat myself, I know Ichiro could not have made Seiichi take any of his money or take any help but it's clear that we don't actually see Ichiro really trying to reach out to Seiichi in that time skip. So all he did in that time really was occasionally ring Seiichi and pay a shitload of money to his sister and brother-in-law. And that little bit of exposition really shows that his actions were motivated more to assuage his own guilt 
than they were to help his own son. It's then that Ichiro takes the time in this letter to say some of the things he should have said in life. He takes responsibility for the things that happened, for the things he should have stopped, or at the very least noticed, which is pretty easy to do when you're too dead to deal with the fallout. His final request then is that once he's cremated, his bones be interred at the family grave in their hometown. And he closes out the letter with one final piece of information. After he divorced Seiko, he had her address, though he never used the information, just kept onto it. He includes that information at the end of the letter to Seiichi, letting him know that he can use it if he ever wants to contact Seiko again. I understand he likely thinks he's doing something helpful here, but this is just another in a series of missteps on Ichiro's part that I just can't even find the goodness in my heart to be like, oh, he's trying to do a helpful. It's fucking stupid. He won't try to force his son to go through any level of therapy or anything like that, but he'll keep forcing the idea of talking to his abuser. Like, don't get me wrong, Ichiro seemed like a nice guy, but he's some fucking head wreck. Seichi flings the paper to arm's length, tears off, and burns that last section, but not before seeing one line of the address. Tokyo. The city he lives in. Skipping past that information for now, the funeral happens, the body is burned, and the remains placed in an urn, and Seichi begins his journey to his hometown to honor his father's final wish. After a brief ceremony, the bones are interred, and Seichi begins to ruminate on what he'll do next before, in a case of insane coincidence, he runs into his childhood crush, Yuiko and her two children. At this point, we know Seiji's no stranger to the odd bit of psychosis-induced hallucination, and I'll get to that in a bit, but this is truly Yuiko. Seiji dips his hat low and tries to hide his face, remarking that her teenage daughter looks exactly like her, and she hits him with one of those, oh, you know, we, oh, we hear that all the time, before asking if she knows him. He just says no, brushes it off, and tries to move past her, and as he does pass her by, it clicks into place for her. We get an image of her seeing in her mind's eye a young Seichi Osabe, and it leaves her just asking simply, Osabe? But Seichi just continues walking, leaving Yuiko behind with a look of morose sadness and nostalgia as she ushers her children back to their father. This little bit of serendipity in another story may have had a happy effect, maybe bolstering Seichi's will to live, but this isn't that kind of story. Seichi takes this as the final indication that he has nothing left to do. With no one left watching over him and some weird element of closure with seeing Yuko one final time, he determines that it's time for him to disappear. It's at this point that I'd like to rewind the clock a bit. We've seen Seiichi alone this entire time, at least that's what we think. He has always had company. Sometimes we see them and sometimes we don't, but the entire time, Shigeru has been with him. We first glanced him after Seiichi's father left for the train, walking home hand in hand with Seiichi, and since then we've seen him at points just silently sitting there with Seiichi, the missing half of a conversation that we only hear one part of. And all this time Seiichi has been promising him that soon he'll join him. He's dead on the inside, he's just waiting for his body to catch up. And it's on that night we finally hear Shigeru speaking as Seiichi attempts to end his life, telling him to hurry up and come play with him. But even his death is snatched away from him as his mother's face, properly like something out of the ring, crawls in from the top of the frame and remarks how disgustingly selfish he is to do something like this. He panics in that moment, slipping loose from the noose and flings himself to the ground, vomiting everywhere, just unable to process it, absolutely terrified at the prospect of Seiko creeping back into his life. But at this point, he's too scared to try anything again, thankfully, and with his first attempt at hitting Alt F4 having failed, he decides that instead it will happen tomorrow. He will do it tomorrow. Now, just so we're clear here, because I'm using humor to lift some of the tension off of this issue, it is good that he doesn't do it. The manga paints a picture of relief for Seiichi in deciding to do this, but suicide is never never the answer. If anyone is dealing with feelings similar to what Seiichi is displaying here, I desperately encourage you to please reach out to friends, family, anyone close, or in lieu of that, any available emergency services in your area. It does get better. With that cleared up, Seiichi does spend most of the following day ideating on what manner he'll use to send himself to the great gig in the sky, but he's caught off guard. Caught off guard by a phone call from a police station. An older woman has been found wandering the streets, confused with only a bag filled with some information, and I think that's how they contacted him. I don't know if there's like government records in Japan that allow people to connect families with their current info, but I believe that information is how they contacted Seiichi. If I got that wrong, please let me know in the comments. These are the little things that I like to be corrected on. And also, a photo album. As the realization hits for him that his mother is actually creeping back into his life, he sprints for an oncoming train, desperate to go before he's pulled 
back in. But we do see an image of Seiko, a, a light silhouette, wrap her arms around him and pull him back from the brink. And once again, thankfully, he fails. With no recourse left to him in his mind and the lid that I've been mentioning now firmly lifted from his Pringles can of trauma, he just kind of, again, slips into that robotic way of doing things and drags himself to the police station and his fateful encounter with Mother Dearest. This scene altogether bothers the shit out of me. The cops effectively blame Seichi for the poor parent-child relationship that's going on and pressure him into paying her rent. She's on the street because she's six months behind and they pressure him into paying that rent. We do see as he manages to wrench his eyes up from staring at his feet, too afraid to even look at her initially, that while it is at a glance, at first glance, an old frail woman, as she turns to take in Seiichi, we see her change in his mind's eye into the Seiko who traumatized him. She looks as she did in the time when she did everything to him to put him in the position he's in now to turn him into the person that he is. And how she acts here really has me in two frames of mind. She flits in and out of lucidity in a way that's common in older people dealing with cognitive decline or dementia, but because of her manipulative nature, I'm inclined to believe that it's at least in part an act that she's putting on for sympathy, and in this case, whether it's true or not, I don't think it fucking matters. Though Seichi, once again on the verge of a breakdown, decides that, after that social pressuring I mentioned, he'll use some of the money his father left him behind to pay for her rent, as well as pay as much rent in advance as he can. I'm assuming just so he can kind of wash his hands and step away once this situation is done. He can pay her rent as far ahead as he can and leave. So the cops escort them back to Seiko's and they come to an agreement with her landlord to pay that backdated rent and however much else he can pay in advance, as I said, and the cops take their leave. He's invited in by Seiko for some tea and again, because he's automating how he's moving, he just goes with it. But once they're sat there having that tea, she recognizes him. You're Seichi, right? You're my son. It's been a long time. And this recognition snaps something inside of him, his face contorting in rage. He lifts his hand up to strike her after flinging hot tea in her face. And in that moment, her shocked and scared, his hand raised to strike, he sees her crying, begging him to stop as a child version of herself, helpless and unable to defend herself, simply afraid in this moment. And the kind person in him, the sweet, loving, kind part of him that is not wanting to hurt someone else who is afraid, like he was, takes over. And we see him just, again, go blank, drop his hand, and turn around to leave, saying he never wants to see her again. And in that last moment, he glances over his shoulder to see her there as she actually is, frail, old, and alone. The story as it transpires from there gets, again, deep and heavy. He uses this vision of Shigeru, this ghost Shigeru, and it does kind of change shapes into, like, a fucked up form of Seiko. But he uses this imaginary person to bounce a lot of his trauma off of. He rages at it, while at the same time throwing a lot of that internalized trauma back at himself. This giant monster version of Seiko telling him that he can't blame Auntie Seiko for the way he is. That he's the only murderer and that he's the real monster. This kind of lets him have a bit of a breakthrough and eventually, after two months, he decides to visit her again. Though mostly it's just due to Ghost Shigeru egging him on about it. He finds himself at her apartment again on the day of a typhoon and he helps her look for a neighborhood cat who she says is called Mi, M-I-I. But in her adult state, she ends up calling the cat Say, which is just a shortened version of his name. It's a pet name for for him, punnily enough. Eventually, they find the cat and return to her home, where he confronts her, asking and kind of stating at the same time that she does remember him, and this is all just an act. She's just pretending to be out of it. She does not answer. She simply turns and looks at him, Oshimi once again showing here just how much he can do with just a character's eyes. That recognition there, regardless of how adult her brain might be. There is understanding and recognition in the look she gives him. She thanks him for the money he's given and the help that he has given her, and offers to make him dinner. For reasons not entirely clear to himself even, he does say yes and stays to have some food and drinks some sake. They talk a little bit, but mostly just share food. And then, as the day drags on due to the dangerous weather conditions, he ends up staying the night. Once again, not entirely certain why he does. I think it is, as we'll see, more to try and get some kind of answers or closure 
from this person. Though it is at this point that myself and several other readers, if Reddit is anything to go by, became worried that things were drifting in an Oedipal direction. Disgusting, I know, but in this story it wouldn't be that shocking. And I'll save you the sickening suspense, it doesn't happen, thank fuck. But the two do lay on the floor across from each other, he on the tatami mat and her on her futon, and after a while of just silence, he broaches a conversation. He asks her how she managed to continue on after everything, and she doesn't really answer, she kind of gives an answer that has some parity with what he did. She says that she just worked. She worked and worked, different jobs, different things, until one day, something kind of clicked. She saw how empty but open the world was, and that caused her to just stop caring altogether. We can assume this was probably around the point, you know, six months before he met her again, when she stopped paying her rent and things just kind of fell apart. But there is a similarity between what she did and how Seiichi did continue on living after he, you know, moved out of home and got out of the juvie detention facility and all that. She then goes and retrieves the photo album that she had on her the day the police found her, and it is filled with photos of him as a child. Some of her and him and Ichiro, but mostly either it's just him or him and her. And from this transpires a series of flashbacks as we find out what kind of a life Seiko had led prior to Seiji being born. And once again, it really isn't much of a life at all. We have a picture painted of a life full of sadness and trauma, again, much similar to the one she affected onto Seiji. Seiko as a child had monsters of her own, eventually trying to escape her awful, hateful mother and the quiet, judgmental town that she lived in. She wished to be an actor. She found joy in doing those things, in being able to step outside of herself, in not having to be the person that she was born as. Even though she does move to Tokyo to try and find this theatre troupe that she loved, and she attends a bunch of their shows, and she tries, she really does. Sadly, her dreams and aspirations don't go anywhere. Eventually, she rekindles an old romance with Ichiro and finds herself judged. Judged for wanting to act, and specifically for wanting to act in this troupe. This theatre troupe apparently has some vaguely explicit things happening, you know, like boobies out and stuff like that, you know, real R-rated stuff. And we can assume this isn't the first time she's met with this kind of judgement. She doesn't allow herself to bloom or develop as a person, and a big reason why is because she was never given the confidence to do so. She has little to no love in her life, and the sadness within her, likely due to her undiagnosed mental illness or illnesses, has caused her to become an empty and withdrawn person. So when Ichiro asks her to move back home with him and get married, she says yes, and in her own words, gave up. Skipping over some things, they marry, her sister dies, and after being given the idea by Ichiro's sister following the birth of Shigeru, Seiko talks with Ichiro and decides that since she never had any love or happiness in her life, that having a child and giving them all the love and happiness that was kind of skipped over for her would make her at last feel some of that happiness herself. That having a child would fix her problems. What an insane thing to think, I'm sure that never happens in real life. We then find both Seichi and Seiko sharing in these joint memories together. Seiko recalling throwing Seichi off the hillside as a toddler, and pushing Shigeru off that cliff, the manga lending visuals to their shared conversation and recollection. Seichi simply responds to the things she says throughout this. He isn't certain how much of his memory is true and how much he may have made up to cope with his trauma, or made up because of his trauma. So hearing her recount these things without him giving her input lets him cement that they actually did happen, and that is something that's essential in moving past events, is recognizing that they did occur, and in confirming their reality, allowing you to begin the process of moving past them, which is something that we do eventually see. And through their conversation together, Seichi sees and understands more now. Seiko did metaphorically kill him, ruining any chance he had at a normal life, let alone a happy one. But the same was done to her, and he supposes that when you're killed in that way, destroyed, both mentally and emotionally, that it's inevitable you'll do the same to others. And so they share in a moment of understanding between one another that no one else could ever share, not without having followed this same trail of blood. The following morning, Seiichi says goodbye to her, and they seem to leave on a relatively good note, as good as either of them could leave on, and he continues living his daily life in indifference, working, going home, and sleeping, and doing that over and over ad nauseum. He doesn't visit Seiko again, and he doesn't hear from her either. Then, one unexceptional day, he gets home from work and decides to tidy up his home, clearing out the trash and pulling open the curtains to let the sun shine in. He starts going to the library and starts reading anything that catches his eye or anything that may have been recommended to him, finding small joys in the things that are available to him. He's stopped drinking and, almost as an afterthought, realizes that he's stopped thinking about killing himself. And so, the seasons turn until, one night, he has a dream. Shigeru wakes him up and it's been a while since we've seen him. He lets him know that he's leaving, that it looks like it's okay for him to do that now. And 
lets him know to go on living, before saying one final bye-bye and stepping into the light, walking through some tall grass to meet his mother somewhere else, somewhere further on from our own existence. And for the life of me, I can't decide if the final look that Shigeru's mother gives him is actually happy or threatening, or a combination of both, but I'm gonna go with threatening specifically because of what happens when Seiji wakes up. He's awoken by a phone call from a hospital letting him know that Seiko Okabe has fallen down the stairs. He does go to her and finds her in a bad state, concussed and not entirely there, and whatever cognitive decline she may have been experiencing beforehand is definitely worsened now thanks to this head injury. Apparently she hit her head pretty bad falling down the stairs of an overpass. Seiji's mind immediately flashes to the idea of Shigeru's mother pushing her, but there's nothing supernatural in this story, it's all just purely awful, horrible coincidence. And Seichi takes her home, back to her own home. And it's at this point I was really, really worried because Seichi had come so far. He'd stopped drinking, he was caring for himself, things were really, really looking up, and I was terrified at the thought that him having to look after or care for Seiko would send him back down that path. But he does take her home, eventually actually moving her into his own home, because he can't afford to pay rent for two places. And he does his best to care for her, even though it does slowly become clear that, even in her dementia adult state, that she has given up completely. And acknowledging this, Seichi tells her that if she's intending to keep falling apart and coming undone like this, then he'll be there to watch her. And watch he does. One particular day coming home to see her there, kind of shivering under the covers, he sees her both as this old woman and as a young child. A brief glimpse into how strange it is that we're so similar when we come into this world as we are when we're getting ready to leave it. She deteriorates further and further and we see Seichi ignoring calls from work, turning off his phone entirely, so that he can be there to watch her as he senses the end approaching. As he watches her lay there one night, his own breathing seems to slip into sync with hers, his eyelids get heavy, and he falls asleep. And it's here that he dreams. He finds himself in the restaurant he and his mother would go to as a child, except now the place is empty, aside from the two of them. Now both looking like they did, back then. Smiling, she tells him, don't be so quiet, to say something. And now, if there's any real moment of emotional catharsis to be found for Seiichi in this story, it is here in this chapter, even if it's all in his head. The entire conversation that transpires is a wonderful look into exactly how dreams work. Your own memories, experiences, trauma, and thoughts are filtered through this weird, strange lens in a place outside of time and reality that is exclusive to you. And it's here that he acknowledges so much that he is both registered and learned over the last while and also that he has not yet dealt with or said to himself since being a child. I won't go over the specifics of this conversation because it does go on for a while but effectively it is a way for him to have one final conversation with Seiko. She at points admonishes him for not looking out for her and not seeing the things that was wrong with her and he stands up for himself saying that he was a child, he couldn't have noticed those things and it wasn't his job to. All he was worried about was if she loved him or not, if he was cared for or not, and also about feeling whether or not he should love her. Because in his mind, after all the trauma that she dumped onto him, all the things that she did to him, the positions she put him in, he of course stopped loving her. In his own mind, he had killed her, destroyed her, pushed her to the side, and the guilt of even doing that to try to protect himself killed him all over again. It was absolutely crushing, but now at least he is beginning to come to terms with it, to move past it. He realizes that he was just a child, scared and alone and desperate for love, and she can only say that she always loved him. And after considering it, Seiichi supposes she's right, that she did love him, but now he's aware of her past and he's old enough to understand his own emotional journey. He can see now that he's lived long enough to know better that her love was not a kind thing, it was born of her own trauma, insecurity, and selfishness. And in spite of that, or perhaps because of that, he lets her know that he guesses he loves her too. Not a clear and pure love, but something else. A love that, again, only the two of them could ever understand. A love that isn't truly love. And for a moment, they silently take in the pouring rain of this dreamscape, Seichi commenting that they had rain like this often when he was a child. And Seiko says that, yeah, we did, but it will stop soon. And in one final moment, Seiko remarks after Seiichi, you know, tells her to just go to hell and die, that, oh, a child who could say such a thing could never be my child. And he laughs in turn and says that, ah, yes, to not be your child anymore would be amazing. And as the two laugh, the panel pulls back, the rain begins to slow, and we're left with one final farewell from Seiko before Seiichi wakes up. 
their last conversation over as a new day dawns. He awakens and finds himself across from what used to be his mother, checking her vitals and finding nothing, he just states the obvious, she's dead. And he bursts into laughter, she is gone again, and he remains a microcosm of their journey together in this room. As he stares at her laying there, he finally pulls his eyes away to consider the curtains, closed but filtering a hazy morning light. He stands, opens them, and the door just behind them, and steps out, considering the misty morning that now ushers in his new life. Walking further out into this obfuscating mist, the past behind him now veiled by it, still there but no longer a part of him in the way it has been his entire life. He gazes up at the mist-broken sun, its light diffused just the same as the streetlights buttressing him on either side. It's as though the world itself is gently welcoming him into this new world, a world that seems so big now, open, a place no longer tainted by his past, and he steps freely into it. He moves forward into this new beginning and fades into it as the trail of blood he's been following since birth finally ends. As that chapter fades out, the next one finds us in the car, with Yuiko and her husband driving through her hometown, or maybe visiting it, I'm not entirely sure. And they stop there for a little while so she can stroll through it. She spots places that are familiar to her, though the memories or emotions that may have been fully part of it are not a part of her anymore. She sees the culvert that herself and Seiichi hid in the night they tried to run away. A night that was filled with fear and terror and anxiety for both of them, but all she remembers is the first kiss that she shared with him there, and she smiles, the badness sucked away from that now, only leaving behind the good. They eventually wind around for another bit until they find an open plot of land, and she realizes with a start that this was Seichi's old house. It's now torn down, and again, it's just open land, and it prompts her to realize that she doesn't even know where he is or if he's even alive anymore, but she hopes that he is. They then leave, and later that night she dreams of him, older now and living in some town that she doesn't know the name of, living his life and seeming content, and just that is enough for her to feel happy. And we see her dream realized in the final chapter, titled A Quiet Space. We see an older Seiichi living alone in a small but cozy and clean apartment, not spick and span, but the kind of lived in clean that you'd expect of someone. He goes about his day, having a glass of juice to start his day off, and takes in this fresh summer morning, the cicadas chirping away. He walks to his local library, takes out a book that catches his eye, and goes to a nearby park, sitting and reading for a while as mothers play with their children. Until a rumbly tumbly lets him know it's time to eat, and he takes out a rice ball that he chose for himself, tuna and mayo. He says thank you for the food, and digs in. Then as the day draws long, the shadows pulling across the park, he marks his page and heads home along the same path he took to get there. Pausing alongside the river, he takes in this beautiful sunset, the light wind blowing, and the fresh cut grass on the verge. And he finds himself thinking, apropos of nothing, about how long it's been since he's even thought of his mother. And as he tries to recall her face, a face that has haunted him his entire life, a face that he was not able to get out of his brain, the visage of the person who caused him so much trauma, who effectively ruined his life. And he comes to the vague realization that he can't even remember what she looked like anymore. And that is where this trail of blood truly ends. So how do you feel? Personally, I could use a lie down and a big old honk of the devil's lettuce, but I still feel like weirdly empty and complete after finishing it again. I've seen a lot of talk about the ending of this, and it seems like there's almost like a 50-50 split of people who are happy with it and not happy with it, and those people then have their own reasons why. A big reason I've seen why people aren't happy with this ending is they thought Seiji would get the girl. It reminds me of the conversation around the ending of Erased, both characters in those stories having childhood crushes that they don't end up with. And don't get me wrong, I love seeing a character get a happy ending and the things that I think that they deserve, but the people who are complaining about him not ending up with Yuiko either weren't reading the same story as I was or they didn't understand it. And I'm not saying that to sound like a big intellectual, I'm saying it because this is not that kind of story. Here at the end, we find an older man whose life was filled with some of the most horrific, terrifying trauma. Someone who, for so long, never wanted to live whose life was haunted by the specter of his abusive mother and the actions he took under her abusive and manipulative embrace. And we see him now living, free from the shackles of this generational trauma foisted upon him by Seiko and on her from her parents, and I'm sure theirs again in turn. That's what this story is about at its core. It's ultimately a tale of how unaddressed mental illness and generational trauma can destroy not only your life, but the lives of those around you. 
That's what the title means. The Trail of Blood is that of those killed by this unresolved trauma, either metaphorically in Seiko and Seiichi's case, or literally in the case of Shigeru. Seiichi was so deeply damaged, never able to fully form his own personality or a sense of self all his own, because from the moment of his birth, his life was shaded by Seiko. To the point that even after she left his life and he found himself depressed and suicidal, desperately trying to keep a lid on everything inside of himself, the emotions tied to it all still tore through at the slightest touch. And this is a story about addressing those issues, and how doing so is often not pretty. It is fucked up and ugly and strange and deeply individual. Do I disagree with parts of the story? Absolutely. Like how it shows Seichi caring for his abuser? I disagree wholeheartedly with that. But it's in doing that that Seiichi finds the only catharsis available to him. He cares for her despite what she's responsible for. He sees her to her final moments and after that he finds some element of closure. Stepping away into a new life, absent of her and moving on to find something new. Is it the most positive ending? Maybe not. But seeing him getting up and going through his day eating a rice ball he chose for himself and enjoying a good book and his walk home made me cry. When dealing with something like depression, you can become acutely aware of how long life can feel and how paradoxically quick it passes. And we see this portrayed so well both in the chapters as they progress as well as through the time skips we see. Huge swaths of time just skipped over from his childhood to his adulthood and again in his old age. But at the end, we see him no longer controlled by that depression or those emotions. And it's in these last panels we see him reflecting on those feelings rather than reacting to them. Simply considering them secure now in his new life. His new, normal life. No longer afraid, no longer destroying himself. Not bitter. He's free to live quietly. Sadly alone, but perhaps it's not up for us to decide if that's sad. All that matters is that he's alive and he's content. And that makes me happy. Whew, thank you so much. If you have made it to the end of this video, give yourself a pat on the back, give yourself a big old hug. That was, that was a lot, and I appreciate you sitting through it. If you did like it, please hit the like button and give me a comment about what you enjoyed or what you found interesting about this story. I truly do think this is one of my top 10 manga, but not for the same reasons anything else on that list might be there. This is just something that was a difficult and interesting read for me. I don't think I'll be rereading it again anytime soon. There are other stories that I know people in the comments of the other video have asked me to cover, like Goodnight Poon Poon and Monster. I've read both of those, but I'll reread them again for videos. If you want to see things like that, as well as a bunch of other just more lighthearted or fun things I have coming down the pipeline, you can subscribe. I'd love to see you join me. Doing all three of the whole like, comment, subscribe really helps small channels like mine and the algorithm. And I also stream infrequently. You can follow me there. The Twitch is down in the description. And my coffee's down there if you feel like buying me a coffee. Help support me making more of these videos. And also my just rampant caffeine habit. All that being said, I'm going to go and watch some Goren Lagann so that I can just kind of wash off all the sad and I'll see you in the next video.